social capital. It is important to climate-proof infrastructure, improve, for instance, the drainage mechanisms in a road, in a road that is uh, constantly being affected by extreme events. So the point I want to make with, all, with, with this slide is that resilience can be built in a variety of ways. And it is very often a narrow perspective when we address climate change as only affecting natural capital. Now one word about uh, ecosystem-based adaptation. I think it is recognized that ecosystem-based adaptation is a low-cost integrated solution to vulnerability reduction. And there are many uh, reports and studies that, uh, that highlight the same. So here's one example that was a very recent publication that was put together where UNDP contributed that analyzes uh, the value of protected areas in providing climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation services. So when you look also at that picture, you see there are multiple adaptation benefits and also co-benefits uh, to intact ecosystems such as food and water quality, energy services, disaster mitigation services, carbon sequestration services, services associated with recreation and health, and also very direct economic re revenues, for instance, from the sale of uh, of timber. Uh, but the point I would like to make here is that usually when looking at these integrated services, we tend to sit back and think that, well, this is great. I mean, this is an integrated solution. So what we have to do is we have to promote conservation and adaptation is automatically taken care of. The thing that we tend to forget is that natural systems themselves have to adapt as well. So even though we are active in conservation, trying to make use and reinforce the adaptive services that ecosystems provide, there are natural tipping points. A coral reef can only buffer so much in ocean acidity, and only so much in, in ocean temperature before it becomes dysfunctional in its protective services. So that is, I think, a, a very important point that I would like to then raise also to the, to the panel here. Those are three questions that I think will lead over to different angles and different perspectives that our colleagues can share with us. One question would be, <coughs> you've all heard uh, the international climate change negotiations. One, one question that, is, that keeps being raised is, <coughs> which country is most vulnerable? And I don't want to get into this political debate because this is not what this, what this forum is here for. But the question is, is there an objective answer to that question? Can we really compare the vulnerability of Maldives to sea level rise with the vulnerability of Bhutan to glacier lake outburst floods? Should we compare that? Can we compare Malawi with Samoa? So if so, which indicators for vulnerability should be used? The second question would be related to the concept of additionality of climate change. If countries cannot address their baseline development problems, does it make sense to address additional climate change risk through dedicated adaptation projects that need to make a case of additionality? And the third question is related to ecosystem-based adaptation. When using this term, do we imply that in order to adapt it is sufficient to conserve? So is this a, a, something that makes us a bit more complacent? And does it distract us from the fact that ecosystems themselves are facing tipping points and that we cannot rely on intact ecosystems uh, for all times to come in order to protect us and provide our services. So with these questions, uh, I think I would like to hand back to the panel and look very much forward uh, to their inputs and then to a hopefully fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for that uh, very useful introduction to the subject and also your three questions. Um, let's move straight into the uh, panel responses. Um, I'll give the floor to Ms. Megumi Muto for your perspectives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I will react on the top down and bottom up approaches that was just mentioned in the presentation and provide some field level realities uh, to the floor in order to <coughs> enhance the discussion. Uh, we can dream
dream of a society that the two directions, top down and bottom up, provide an optimal solution at the intersection. However, we have many difficult issues ahead related to classical social choice issues. One is the intersection between individual choice and top-down choice. Let me give you an example from the ADP World and JICA joint study on uh, climate change adaptation in Asian coastal cities that I joined looking into the case of Metro Manila. In Metro Manila, JICA has been supporting many flood control projects from back in the 90, uh, no, in the 70s, uh, DPWH, which is the Department of Public Works and Highways of the Government of the Philippines, exerted good leadership in implementing these projects to protect the people, such as floodway, dikes, and pumps. One issue that preoccupies our DPWH colleagues is that poor people start living on those structures once they are built. A typical case is Mangaha Floodway, that diverts water from passing Marikina River system to Laguna de Bay. Poor households, mostly immigrants from rural area, start building two, three, even four story structures along the slope of the floodway. Very vulnerable. These people are the, uh, I consider, the most vulnerable uh, to flooding in Metro Manila. And they are, from a top-down uh, point of view, uh, they are disturbing the effecti effectiveness of the infrastructure deemed necessary from the top-down approach. But these are also bottom-up results of people coping with the harsh realities of, the, of finding a space in the urban area. Can we just claim that the poor is acting against public good? No. We have to look into why these people end up there. So vulnerability is not just looking at the vulnerability of today, but we have to ask why these people uh, had to choose to become vulnerable. Without that, we cannot find solutions at the intersection of top-down and bottom-up. Second example is the interaction between local choice and region-wide choice, as uh, the chair mentioned at the beginning. Let me give you another example. <coughs> Many local governments in Metro Manila, to save the poor constituents in their jurisdiction, they are bringing pumping facilities to divert flood water. Flow, flood water. And these attempts are called bombastic and praised as an innovative local approach. However, these water pumps are just throwing excess water to the next community and creating man-made flooding. <coughs> It may be wiser to coordinate the operation of these pumps, but joint action amongst LGUs is very difficult because uh, their accountability, the accountability of the local government is stronger towards the constituency and weaker towards the public good. So in conclusion, the interaction, the intersection between top down and bottom up is very, very challenging. And I welcome all of the people in this room to work together to build knowledge and put into practice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nagumi, uh, for that very concrete, two very concrete examples of how we need to find the right balance between the top down and bottom up approach with a focus on the vulnerable populations, and also highlighting the Um, I'd just like to thank the forum organisers for the chance to present on this panel. I just want to share a couple of my thoughts, particularly um, drawing on some of the questions raised, but also the presentation earlier. I think we can see that climate change affects us all, but it doesn't affect us all equally. The more marginalised and the poorest are affected the most and often the most quickly by climate change. So, and this is not only about future trends and predictions, 2050, 2100, we're also seeing changes in the immediate term. The people who rely on natural resources and have limited buffering capacity are the closest to the edge, if you like, and small incremental changes in climate conditions can have major impacts on their lives and their livelihoods. 
The UNFCCC recognises these differential impacts through the equity principle and recognition of unequal burden, meaning that those that have contributed the least to climate change are feeling the effects the most. And with limited resources for adaptation, we need, we need to prioritise how we respond to these challenges. But I'd like to probably reflect a little on the comments of the provocateur about um, the, the term vulnerability, because we need to be clear about what we each mean when we term, use the term vulnerability. Um, and whether it's really an end point, so an end point to the assessment of impacts and the result in adaptation, so really sort of the net impact of climate change, or whether it's the starting point where social, cultural, economic and political factors are underst understood as contributing to that vulnerability. This is a complex picture, but one that we have to understand in its, complex, in its context for effective adaptation. For CARE and for many others, climate change adaptation requires both the integration of climate change into development projects, so ensuring that they're resilient to climate change impacts, but also have minimal greenhouse emissions, but also targeting the world's most vulnerable human communities, focusing on activities that make, a big, make the biggest difference to their climate vulnerability. The goal of community-based adaptation is to build the resilience of individuals, households, and communities and societies. And it's most effective when we see it as a long-term process rather than an outcome. It requires that we strengthen both their local livelihoods, reduce disaster <coughs> risks, create an enabling environment for effective action at all of those levels through things like capacity development, good governance, and sound environmental stewardship, but also that we tackle social inequity we need to work to knock down discriminatory structures that would prevent people from adapting to climate change. And this in itself is a major driver of underlying vulnerability. There is, if you like, an existing development debt, an existing need for reducing poverty, improving health and education, re reducing environmental degradation. We've been working on these goals for many years. Our achievements to reducing this debt over more than 50 years of development practice are, are themselves threatened by climate change. And we can, we, cannot, we can no longer do development without also considering climate change. And so we need more sophisticated approaches to analysis and more sophisticated approaches to genuine participation of all people, including the marginalised and the poor, to, to ensure that we are designing and managing both development and adap adaptation projects effectively in a changing climate. We are, in reality, working in an ever more dynamic environment with changing <coughs> climatic trends happening over time. <coughs> I thought perhaps an example might illustrate some of these thoughts. I was recently um, visiting communities in the Irrawaddy Delta in Myanmar where CARE has been working primarily uh, on disaster response and recovery after Cyclone Nargis. Now these communities have not yet fully recovered, although there's been some major gains made. They still feel the effects of infrastructure damage and their livelihoods are still struggling to recover. I visited both care field staff and those communities and was really struck by the, the common messages coming from those people. They were talking about changing climate patterns and more erratic rainfall and specific conditions that mirrored very accurately with what the national data was saying is what had been observed across their weather patterns. And it was clear that these communities are, effect are affected by many other factors as well as these changing climatic patterns. Environmental degradation upstream is contributing to siltation of the delta and changing water flows. And if we don't understand this as well as these climatic changes, we will we'll limit the success of our interventions. These communities also live, of course, in a complex political environment, some experiencing uh, limitations to their movement and limited access to information and services. We need to understand all of these conditions to, to design our interventions. Without understanding and addressing these underlying causes of vulnerability, environmental, environmental degradation, marginalisation, etc., even with the best climate models, we'll be missing the mark in our interventions. We need both the top-down and the bottom-up that the provocateur mentioned, and we need to work at ways to better understanding these changing conditions that communities are experiencing. Sound ecosystem management is part of an effective adaptation strategy, but it's not the only element we need to consider. An approach to adaptation is, in, is needed, which also addresses livelihoods, risks, the enabling environment, and social equity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, and thank you for reminding us that the poorest are often the most vulnerable, and uh, <coughs> that we do need to prioritize our responses. 
until the end.